Hello, today I'm going to do something a little bit different. I am actually going to you dig out my player's handbook, my original, not original, my advanced Dungeons and Dragons player's handbook and Dungeon Master's guides. And I am going to do something I've never really actually done before, and that is actually build a character in this edition from scratch. Now, when I played this edition, I normally was just kind of handed a character sheet. I was just a little kid at the time, so I would like be basically playing somebody's henchman or just some sheet that I'd be handed for the time that I was there. Um, used to be a little hobby store. Uh, they sold like model trains and model cars and stuff. And they also had like a big kitchen table set up, um, like basically a big sheet of plywood with some on some sawhorses and chairs all the way around it. You'd have 10, 12 more people just crowded around it all playing the same same game. So, and most of the players were older than me. I mean, that was the, I was actually there with, there with my uncle. So I didn't go very often, but uh, when I did, I got to play. And then I would just, like I said, be handed some character sheets. So today I am going to actually sit and attempt to create a character using um, the rules that, that are laid out in these two books. Um, it does take both of the books to uh, actually roll up a character completely. Um, and I'll just be recording it here onto a character sheet. I found this character sheet online. I think it was off the Dragon's Foot website. Um, it was a nice, clean, simple character sheet. Not the old goldenrod, the yellow character sheets. Um, that apparently lots of people used. Although when I was when I would play, I would just be handed a uh, piece of notebook paper with uh, everything written out on it. So um, having a nice character sheet is actually kind of a bonus here. Um, so just a general disclaimer: I'll probably make a mistake or two here, but uh, it's all part of the learning process. I have my trusty pen ready to go. Looking for it a moment ago, couldn't find it anywhere. Just laying there all the whole time. So, when you're getting started in, uh, this is a fourth printing from May 1979 of the uh, Player's Handbook and the Dungeon Master's Guide is a revised edition December 1979 it says um, for whatever that's worth get back to there all right so to do this first looking in the player's handbook it says that um, each and every character here, says that each and every character has six principal characteristics, and they are in uh, strength, intelligence, wisdom, dexterity, constitution, charisma. Now, I've been playing with my kids a lot of 5E lately, uh, for the past few years, actually. I've played second edition for a long time. And lately, kind of transitioning into 5e, uh, just because it's uh, of the Adventure League stuff, and it was easier f with uh, some of the kids. But uh, kind of circling back around right now, and the uh, reason I mention that is in 5e stuff, and I don't know, maybe 4 and 3, I have no idea, but Strength, Intelligence, Wisdom, Dexterity, Constitution, Charisma are in this order. And in the newer stuff, it's that the physical skills first, the strength, dexterity, and constitution, and then uh, either wisdom, intelli or wisdom, intelligence, or wi intelligence, wisdom, and then charisma's last. Um, so it's always kind of kind of fun when I I'll always say it this way, and then I get people looking at me saying you're you're, you're saying it wrong. Like that's just how I learned it, I guess. So, but. Um, it also says here that, uh, furthermore, it is usually essential to the character's survival to be exceptional with a rating of 15 or above in no fewer than two ability characteristics. So, 
however we decide to roll the dice, uh, whichever method we decide to use, um, we'll have to keep that in mind that we want at least a couple of 15s in there to have a an exceptional type of character. Um, not to say that a uh, more average type of character isn't fun to play, because I've certainly played a few of them, but but uh, having a little bit of, uh, especially in your prime characteristics, of course, are, are always kind of fun. And of course, playing a perfect character with say all 18s would be boring. And every so often you run across somebody either online or in person who brags about that. I rolled all 18s. And I'm say, say to them, good for you. Now, what did you roll for your actual character? Because that just sounds boring to me to have an all 18 character. You're perfect in everything. So that, and I don't, I mean, it's statistically possible to roll all 18s, but I would believe it if I saw it, I guess. With, you know, non-trick dice. So those methods, looking back at this book here, and these are not, I mean, I, I only ever borrowed books. I actually ended up buying these quite a few years ago, but uh, they were used when I got them. Love to have had my uncle's books, of course, because those are the ones I used the most. But, but these are the books that he had. I'm not exactly sure which edition or which version that he had, but it was uh, very close and very similar to these. But we could use method one. All scores are recorded and arranged in the order the player desires. You roll 4d6, and the lowest die is discarded, you know, which I think is the method that we normally used or was normally used. Um, like I said, I didn't really, wasn't ever really involved too much in, uh, in rolling them up, and I've never rolled one up myself. I did help roll up a couple of them once. And uh, one of them was like instantly eaten by a frog and the other one drowned um, within the first hour of play for both of them. So neither one of them lived long. I think it took longer to make the character than it did for them to actually play with the character. Um, method two, all scores are recorded and arranged as in method one. You use 3d6, but you get to roll 12 times. So maybe it gets uh, you know, a little bit better ob odds there so you get to you only have to use the top six scores you get to use the top six scores method three scores rolled according to each ability in order strength intelligence wisdom dexterity constitution charisma 3d6 are rolled six times for each ability and the highest score in each category is retained for that category so you, you don't get to mix them around like you do with method one and two you get to roll six times so you're probably going to end up with a nice number eventually um in method four 3d6 are rolled sufficient times to generate the six ability scores in order for 12 characters the player then selects the single set of scores which he or she finds most desirable and these scores are noted on the character record sheet now, I'm not sure if you if it's similar to 3, but you're doing 12, or if these are the 12 players, you get to like debate and pick out. That'd be kind of fun. You'll get to debate and pick out which set of scores you get to use for your character. It'd be like, well, I, I wanted to play the magic user, so I wanted these sets of scores, but I wanted to play the thief, or I wanted to play the fighter. And so you got to kind of work as a team there. Because you, you could have a dozen people at the table, a dozen players at at the uh, table. So you could end up using all, all 12 of those. So the DM were to just hand out a sheet and say, there you go, pick. That could be entertaining. Um, for this demonstra for this, not really demonstration, for this uh, um, experiment, I'm not going to call it an experiment, I'm going to go ahead and uh, just use method one, I think. Uh, that's the roll 46 and then uh, drop the lowest and then put them in whatever order makes sense. I will probably be making a fighter. I can't imagine even trying to make anything else for the first character. So that's what I will plan to do. And then let's go ahead and get that character sheet over here. And I'm going to go ahead and do the little zoom out thing. Okay. So 
character's name. Uh, we're gonna go ahead and just name this character Mountain. He thinks he's a he's a he he he, he thinks he's pretty tough and impressive. It'll remain to be seen if he is, but we're just gonna go ahead and name him Mountain. I oftentimes name my characters just kind of off the wall stuff like that. And Mountain it is. Um, don't know for sure what class or race he's going to be. He'll be level one. We know that. And I am using a pen here just for the sake of the camera. But uh, if I ended up actually getting to play this, um, I'm not sure how I would end up playing it. But if I did, I would have to rewrite it in, in a pencil. So not too worried about that. Or a lot of times, you know, even if I'm in second edition and the fifth edition, if I'm playing, um, I will oftentimes just write stuff out in pen because when I level up I'll get a new fresh sheet and I'll rewrite the whole thing with all of the um changes in the on the new character sheet that way I have a record going back of what it was at first level what it was at second level and I'll even indicate on the sheet you know that what changed um if I'm not sure you know if I have to uh if I'm adding hit points or something I'll, I'll i'll indicate the the amount of hit points added as an example um probably gonna be male never actually ever played a female i just never had the desire i guess but some people played with a lot of people so and i've just never never had the desire to go uh, let's see there's your hair Eyes, height, you can roll all that out of the books if you want or just write it in there. It's not really going to have any real impact on what I'm doing here. Let's just go ahead and go straight to the ability scores. Now I'm going to be using my big jumbo dice simply because it's going to be easier to see. I hope. I hope. I have one little dice in there because I didn't have four of the d4s and if i roll um if i do do a fighter i'm going to need uh to roll four d4s for the money but uh so i put the six d6s in there Give it a shake put it in there so i got a four two four and a one well let's see that'll be i don't we i'm going to drop that one that gives us 10 so write down 10 And then we have, oh, we're not doing too good here. I hope the uh, dice heat, uh, warm up a little bit. That'll be a nine. Maybe give them a little bit of a shake. That help at all? We have a nine to a 12. Three, four, five is 12. Come on, big numbers. I have a 13. It's that old casino game chuckle luck or whatever. I feel like this must be what I'm doing here. Um, here's a 14. I'm sure not going to get... Uh, yeah, that's just going to be a 9 again. So I'm sure not going to get a... Uh, um, exceptional character with the 215s or more, but that shouldn't be too bad. Now, I don't remember um, racial bonuses, if humans have any racial bonuses or not. So that'll be something to look up right away, because I'm, I'm highly confident I'm going to just be rolling up a human, because that'll be simplest for me. Maybe if I do this a few times, I'll get uh, all experienced and practiced and I'm gonna roll up something else. Let me see here. Somewhere in this book, it talks about the races, character race, here we go. Um, racial stock of character. Uh, that's for the classes. And, of course, humans can be anything, and they're unlimited in the level that, that they can go to. 
like I said, we're going to be doing probably a fighter, a human fighter, and they can be unlimited in level there. Uh, if you want to you play some kind of a demi-human, and there is mm, scores that you have to uh, make for that, but I don't think I'm going to be playing demi -human, any kind of demi-human, at least trying to keep it simple here to start with. Okay, here we are, page 17. Let me zoom in a little bit there so you can kind of see what I'm looking at. Human characters are neither given penalties nor bonuses as they are established as a norm upon which these subtractions or additions for racial stock are based. Human characters are not limited as to what class of character they can become, nor do they have any maximum limit. Other than that in intrinsic to the class of level they can attain within a class as they are the rule rather than the exception the basic information given always applies to humans and racial changes are noted for differences as applicable for non-human or part human stocks so humans are are the uh standard and everything else is a deviation from that standard so good to know uh, racial preferences table um Humans, uh, let's see here. Neutral. Uh, they think of most races as neutral. Uh, they are tolerant of half-elves. And they are um, prefer other humans, which, which I guess makes sense. Um, where some of the other races, they, uh, you know, dwarves, pre prefer dwarves. They are... Uh, they have an A there for el elves, antipathy. Um, basically, they don't like elves. G for gnomes, um, goodwill. N for half elves, I think that's neutral. G for halflings, goodwill. So just kind of a little, how the various uh, races, and I love this picture here of all the little races here, the human the dwarf the elf the half or orc and the half elf there's i remember looking at that when i was a kid and just being so fascinated by the by that whole idea there of the various fantastical demi-human creatures but anyway Taking a look at our numbers here, 10, 9, 12, 13, 14, 9. Obviously, for a fighter, we're probably going to want some strength. Let's go ahead and flip back to the fighter section, or flip forward to the fighter section. And I probably should have done some bookmarking here, but that's all right. The fighter uh, wants strength, of course. To become a fighter, you have to have a minimum of nine and a constitution of seven. So a strength of nine and a constitution of seven or greater. No problem with our numbers. A good dexterity is also desirable. If you have a strength above 15, you get to add 10% experience, but a 14 was our bit highest number, so we will not be getting that bonus. Uh, we'll use a 10-sided die for our hit points, uh, and of course we roll every level for our hit points. There's no average, there's no maximum at first level. I'm guessing with those numbers we're not going to get a constitution bonus either. Um, I'll have to double check that, but I don't think we will. And eventually they can uh, uh, become a lord and establish a freehold and stuff. But here's something I, that I love about the first edition stuff too, is the level titles. And they have this for all, all the classes. Like a level five, you're a swashbuckler. I mean, that just, it's more fun to me, I guess. I, I really wish that they had maintained that in the later editions. I mean, they could have had come up with better titles, but but uh, it's just kind of fun. Because some of the titles don't really make sense, especially when you look at the cleric table. Apparently the cleric changes religion quite often and on the cleric table but uh look at the cleric table here he starts out as a accolade adept priest curate per a perfect a canon a llama and a patriarch and a high priest i mean he kind of changes some religions there but so that's a little bit silly but but even like you know the druids where they have oh i'm an initiate of the first circle the second circle i can't really see that can you 
first circle, second circle, and so forth. At least that, uh, you know, the, I am a druid. I am an arch druid. You know, that sort of gives would g give your characters ways to talk to each other that indicates their their abilities and their levels without saying, yeah, I'm a level five fighter. You could say, I am a swashbuckler. So yeah, it just sounds, sounds more exciting. I mean, this guy here isn't going to walk up and say, I'm a level five fighter. He's going to walk up and, and as he's taking out this devil here, he's going to, uh, yeah, he's going to have better, a better title for himself, but, but they did away with those. Um, but that was a D10, basically, and of course, uh, strength, constitution, dexterity. But we want to put our numbers in. So we can do that. We have our strength, constitution, and dexterity. Uh, strength, we'll put our 14, since that's our important skill. So we'll be used to that one. And then constitution, we'll go ahead and put our 13 there. And then our 12 and dex, at least these other numbers aren't like horrible. We don't have like a three or anything. Um, so charisma, eh, charisma could be nice if he's a 10. Uh, might not be the most wise individual, but he's not going to be casting spells or anything either in, anyway. So, but 19 or a 10 for intelligence and a 9 for wisdom is not a terrible um, Terrible for that. At least uh, you can work with a party and talk to the party uh, without having to make yourself sound stupid, um, which is always nice. So to fill out the rest of this table, then we have to refer back to. Oh, we might as well figure out what his hit points are right away, right? So we need to grab a ten-sided dice and roll that. We'll just give that a roll right here. Oh, seven. Yeah, seven's not bad. Beats a one. So on this sheet here, there's a spot I can write down my hit points. Oh, I'm not seeing it. So I'm just going to write it here at the bottom, and eventually I will see it, probably. And then I'll put it in the right spot. But he starts out with seven hit points, so that's pretty good. Used to being in by the armor class is where you have your hit points. I don't see that there, so whatever. Not a big deal. There was a second sheet to this, but you would think that that something like that would be on the top sheet. But anyway, let's go ahead and back to our tables. So here's our strength table. And what we do with the strength table, you just go ahead and find your number. In our case, strength was 14. So we find the 14th under ability score. And then just slide over and take a look and copy the information that's here. Um, hit probability is normal. Uh, so just, there's no um, change to that. Damage adjustment, oh, it's a hit probability. He doesn't have any exceptional strength either. Uh, hit probability is normal, damage adjustment, no damage adjustment, weight adjustment, plus 200, uh, doors, open doors, 1 to 2, bend bars, lift gates, 7%, hopefully he doesn't get stuck behind a portcullis, because he's probably not opening it, so you have to roll that or less on a, on, you know, on your percentile dice. That's a hundred sided dice. It's probably not going to happen. All right. And of course, there's these tables here too, which gives you the general information for the various fans. For example, this is strength. His strength of 14. That's the maximum possible for a female halfling character. The males and female characters um, have different uh, um, ability. Uh, Unlike the modern RPG where it's all all the same, in these versions of the games, they actually called those out. Oh, let's see. And of course, you can be a you need at least nine to be a fighter. Um, you need at least eight to be a dwarf. We're not going to be a dwarf. We're going to be a human. Although dwarf might have been fun. Um, 
but we're going to stick with human. Intelligence. He's not going to cast spells, so I'm not going to write this down. But his intelligence was 10. So if he was to be a spellcaster, 45% or 45 chance to, to learn a spell. He could A minimum number of spells he could know is 5. And the maximum is 7. Um, with the ability score of, say, 19, if you got their uh, wish or something, then you could actually know all the spells. But... Our guy isn't going to cast any spells, so that's not important to him. Same thing with wisdom. Um, he's not going to cast. He's not going to cast any spells for 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 clerics and so forth. So we're not really have to worry about any of that. Um, and uh, one other thing was the chance of spell failure um, for lower level. That was always kind of a fun little feature too. But but we get over to dexterity here, and his dex is twelve. Let me just zoom back out here. His dex is 12, which is the minimum dexterity for an assassin. That, but it's a zero for attacking adjustment and zero for defensive adjustment. So um, it's just zero and zero. Uh, constitution. Get over to Constitution. His constitution was a 13. I don't think that's going to... Uh, that's zeros all the way across. And that's all the... Year. Oh, no, that's dexterity. I was looking at the thieves table for dexterity. Constitution table, he's 13. He is zero hit point adjustment as expected. 85% system shock survival and 90% resurrection, though. So I'll write that down just... In he were to die and some handy cleric were to be around to help him out, there's a chance he could, pretty good chance he could come back, actually. And then charisma. The charisma table here. And that was a 10. So he could have four henchmen. And they would have normal loyalty and normal reactions. So all around a pretty average person, um... And the higher number there for Constitution to get a hit point adjustment, you have to be at least a 15 to get a plus 1 to your hit point. 16 gives you plus 2. And then finally, 17 or 18 also give you plus 2, unless you're a fighter, and then it becomes plus 3 and plus 4. So a bonus to your Constitution right away can actually, you know, really help. But say if I were to have rolled an 18... I would have had to think long and hard about putting it here in under constitution or putting it under strength because those you know, four extra hit points would make a pretty big deal so you know in in combat of course as a fighter he also would be get to roll for exceptional strength so the hit probability and damage adjustments would go way up that's why i'd be thinking long and hard about which which would be the best place to put that? Do you want to hit harder, or do you want to take more more punishment? I'm guessing I would, you know, go with the hit harder, but taking more punishment sometimes that's uh, good for your frontline character. So that is how we fill out that section. Um, might as well go ahead and grab the saves next. Uh, the saves are actually going to be over in the dungeon master's guide. Uh, under the fighting tables, uh, somewhere in the 70s. Yep, 70s. Page 74. Are your attack matrixes, and here we are. There's the attack matrix on page 74 for fighters, paladins, rangers, bards. Um, we'll have to write that down. But right after that should be our saving throws. Yep, here we are. Saving throws over on page 79. Um, so, yep. He's a level one character. So you just write these down. He has to roll better than that if he needs to save on them. So level one, paralyzation, poison, or death magic. That's a 14. Uh, petrification or polymorph is a 15. Rod staff wand is a 16. 
breath weapons is 17 and spell is a 17 and i don't know what special is it's on the kid it's not in the book so guessing that's something extra that we're not going to worry about um armor class we'll figure out when he buys his armor um Weapon proficiencies as a fighter are proficient in everything. If you read the fighter section, it tells you they're proficient in everything. The role you need to hit an armor class is below. So we will take a look at that. We'll take a look at the weapon and the bonus to hit armor class. We can grab all of that on the player's handbook. So back to the player's handbook. Actually, no, some of that will be in the Dungeon Master's Guide. The... Uh, some of that will come from both. So, let's get over to the uh, equipping your character section, because that's really the next step. Because to figure out our armor class, we need to figure out what he has for armor. And to figure out what he has for armor, we need to roll. Go over here on page uh, 35. Tells you that a cleric... Uh, would get uh, between 30 and 180 or roll 3d6 and multiply by 10. A fighter, 50 to 200 or 5d4. Magic user is 20 to 80, 2d4. Thief, 20 to 120, 2d6. And a monk, 5 to 20, 5d4. Uh, but fighter, we get to roll 5d4s. So go ahead and put our d4s in there, including the little one. This is a normal d4. It just looks tiny next to my jumbo D4s. Okay, let's see what we got here. We have a one. Oh, oh yeah, I'm going to tip them over. We have a one, we have a three, another one, and a four. So, yeah, we didn't do too good here. We have, uh, what, uh, three, four, five, nine. Nine times ten is ninety. We are not going to be able to purchase um, a lot of stuff. There's 90 gold, that's what we're starting with here. But, chainmail is 75, and a longsword is 15. I kind of wanted to get him a shield. Um, might have to go with the ring mail, or the scale mail. I could go with the scale mail, that's the next step down. It's probably what we're going to have to do is go with scale for 45. I'll get him a large shield. And a large shield is 15. And one thing with shields here, too, like the small shields can take one hit. Um, it says on the next page here. A small shield can uh, take one hit or can be used once during a melee round. A normal sized shield uh, can uh, be used against two melee attacks and a large against three. Uh, if you get hit a fourth time, even with that large shield, you wouldn't be able to use your shield bonus anymore. So we're going to that large shield though, that way you can take at least three hit, three attacks and be able to use his shield. And we're going to want a long sword. And that will give uh that's 15 gold. So that's 30, that's 75. Yeah, 75 gold he's used. And that leaves him, uh, what, 15 gold pieces to uh, purchase the rest of the things he might need. I mean, he's going out on an adventure. He's probably going to want a backpack. That's a couple of gold. He's going to want some clothes. That'll be about, about a gold. He's going to need some light, some oil. So he's going to have to be really stingy with that. Uh, with that. A week's worth of iron rations is five gold. A week's worth of standard is three gold. So you'll have to probably buy, if you've bought a week's worth of standard rations, that's three gold right there. That takes him down to 12. A couple for a backpack. He has 10. Um, he's going to want some kind of a light source. Probably going to have to buy torches. He can stock up on a ton of torches. They're super cheap. And a tinder box. That was a, as a complete gold piece. So, so yeah, he would definitely uh, not be buying anything extra or special. 
with that remaining gold. He wouldn't have very much left at all. He better be headed straight to the local dungeon so he can loot the gold that he'll find there. All right. Let's take a look at... Let me put this to the side for now. His weapon that he just bought was a long sword. Hope he doesn't get encounter a rust monster. Um, so let's just take a look here. Uh, the weapon damage for a long sword, sword long, is going to be for a small medium, is going to be 1d8 or 1 to 8. So the small is 1 to 8, and the um, large creature is 1 to 12. If you were to encounter something else, that's, that's large. And the range, of course, it's it's not a ranged weapon or anything, so there's no really range for that other than right next to him. Uh, bonuses to hit armor types. It's not on this page. Armor class adjustments. Next page over... Uh, long sword. See, the space required is three feet. I guess you could potentially put that under range as three feet. Um, speed factor is five. That would come in for initiative, I think, if I remember right. It's been a long time. But we're not recording any of that here, it seems. Uh, but the bonus is to hit armor types. I believe that's where these armor class adjustments would go. And then up here would be the two hit table that you would get from the the two hit table that you would get from the dungeon master's guide. So because on the on the old goldenrod sheets. It goes from 10 to 2, and that those are the numbers that come from the Dungeon Master's table. This might be the newer... I'm not really sure what they're looking at right there. I see they have Thacko there, unless they're doing something with Thacko. I know Thacko actually came out before 2nd Edition did. Lots of people in 1st Edition used Thacko. I don't remember using Thacko when I played... Uh, played first edition but i was usually just rolled the dice and was told what happened so we could have very easily been using thaco but this table here the bonus is to hit armor class is going to be this table here and so for the long so for our first level character he is going to have these numbers here. So basically, it's just right in our 20, 19, 18, 17, 16, 15, 14, 13, 12, 11, 10. Starting with, uh, with the zero. So if we can counter to K, uh, somebody who had an armor class of zero, he'd have to roll a 20. Armor class of one, he'd have to roll a 20. And then after that, it just goes down and descending. And as you go up in level, that obviously increases. So that same character, when they reach ninth level, you know, they don't, to hit that zero level character, they don't have to roll a 10 to hit, uh, they can always hit somebody who's uh, armor class 10 if they're, you know, 11th level. If they're 10th level, they would have to roll at least a two, a one or a two, so. There's a, a point where they just always hit. You, know, you get 17th level, um, fourth level and below, they're basically hitting it. So, unless there's something really weird going on. All right, it's going to get one attack per round because he's first level. Weapon would be his longsword. He's not going to use two weapons. I'm not going to worry about unarmed stuff. 
Ah, so the only thing left then is our armor class. So, once again, he bought scale mail. So we would indicate that. And figure out our armor class for using scale mail. And that is right here. Once again, in the player's handbook, right under the equipment section, page, page 36 there. I'm going to go ahead and already in there so scale mail plus a shield is five or if I, could, if I could have afforded the chain mail that would have been five and with a shield that would have been four on armor class but scale mail with a shield will at least get some to five so we'll go ahead and write that on our character sheet so his armor class his base armor class will be five um actually his base armor class will be six shieldless will be five did i write that right scale mail plus shield is five scale mail by itself is six yes so if he's his base is six shieldless is five i do not know how to calculate rear but i'm guessing it's some kind of penalty um, of course, he's not getting any dexterity panel, uh, or bonuses or anything. Armor worn. He's got scale. And for weapons, proficiency is all. Yeah, the Th Thaco thing for first edition, I would have to go look that up for sure. But that's really neat that they included it on this character sheet. And yeah, that's pretty much what there is to rolling up a first level fighter in first edition D, D. i don't think i messed up too badly um i may have written something wrong somewhere but overall i think i actually remembered pretty well how to do it and it's been a long time so um, now he can just uh go out and do some adventuring and hopefully he'll come back and be able to buy better armor better weapons clothing um, so on and so forth so hope you enjoyed this i hope it was maybe somewhat useful and i think uh, for another video i am going to attempt to run some combat i'll have to uh that one i am going to have to pull out the monster manual and actually read the section on combat because there's no way i can remember exactly how to do it but uh so yes uh thank you for watching and um Hopefully you uh, tune in for another one. Thanks. Bye.